Thank you. That concludes general questions. The next item of business is First Minister's questions. At question number one, I call Douglas Ross. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Uh, at the weekend, SNP members met in Dundee to have an independence conference. During Hamza Yusuf's speech, a brave woman spoke out. Theresa Mallet protested on behalf of herself and a group of more than 100 other patients of the disgraced surgeon Sam El Jamel. Dr El Jamel left NHS Tayside patients who came for help scarred, broken and devastated. Theresa wants answers. She is demanding a public inquiry. But when Hamza Youssef uh, was Health Secretary, he refused to grant one. So can he tell Theresa and all of the victims of Dr El Jamel why he refused to grant that public inquiry? First Minister. Presiding officer, uh, I have agreed to meet with uh, Ms Mallet and I'm due to meet with her, I believe, uh, early uh, next week. And of course, when I was uh, Cabinet Secretary for Health and Social Care, I also met a number of other uh, victims of Professor El Jamel. And let me start this answer by, uh, by reiterating um, just how uh, much sympathy I have for the trauma that they have undoubtedly suffered at the hands of Professor El Jamil. Let me also put on record that a number of MSPs from across the backbenches have raised issues on behalf of their constituents who again have been traumatised by the disgraceful actions of Professor El Jamil, including his own backbench colleague uh, Liz uh, Smith uh, as well. Uh, what I would say to Douglas Ross is that uh, as First Minister, indeed Michael Matheson as Cabinet Secretary uh, for Health, uh, we will continue to not just engage with all of those who have been affected by Professor El Jamel's disgraceful actions. Uh, what we will seek to do is get the answers that they want. And that goes to the heart of why a public inquiry has not been completely ruled off the table. The reason why we have not committed to a public inquiry on the issue of Professor uh, El Jamel's actions is twofold. Uh, first and foremost, we all know uh, in, in this chamber that a public inquiry uh, can take some years, rightly so, understandably so. And therefore, is there a way of getting the answers that the victims Professor El Jamel want? Can we get that sooner? Can we get it quicker, as opposed to often the years and years it can take for a public inquiry? That's the first uh, reason why we haven't instructed a public inquiry. The second reason, uh, of course, is that Professor El Jamel is not in this country. Uh, he is uh, practising, I believe, as a doctor, uh, elsewhere, overseas, uh, abroad. Uh, the likelihood of Professor El Jamel, uh, I think, uh, uh, cooperating with any public inquiry uh, is very, uh, very uh, low. And therefore, would a public inquiry be able to get the answers that the victims like Ms Mallet uh, and others are seeking? So I, I will end um, where I started, which is a public inquiry hasn't been ruled completely off the table. But what we're seeking to do with all the victims of El Jamel is can we get them the answers that they deserve in a way that is quicker and more expeditious than going through a public inquiry. Douglas Ross. So if I can take the two points that the First Minister has mentioned. First of all, the pace of a public inquiry. Surely the quicker it is actioned and starts, the quicker we can start to get answers for victims like Teresa and so many others. And secondly, we should not be letting Dr El Jamel off by assuming that he will not respond or cooperate. He is a key part of this, but there are others at NHS Tayside and the victims that we need to hear from. Because Ms Mallet told the First Minister on Saturday that she wants people responsible to be under oath so victims might finally get answers that I think the First Minister and I both agree they deserve. The First Minister also mentioned the cross-party support that have actioned this with the current Health Secretary. Uh, they met with Michael Matheson in April. He promised an update by the end of May. We are now at the end of June and my colleague Liz Smith has written to him twice in the last week seeking that update. This morning he responded to say he is currently too busy to meet with the cross-party group but will look to do so uh, in the coming weeks. But surely, given these allegations came to light, more than a decade ago, we cannot wait any longer. So can the First Minister ensure that his Health Secretary responds to all MSPs who are concerned about this immediately? First Minister. Well, 
as Douglas Ross referenced in his question, Michael Matheson has obviously engaged with cross-party MSPs. I have engaged, and indeed health secretaries before me have engaged uh, in this issue, not just with uh, cross-party MSPs, but with the victims of uh, Professor uh, El Jamel. And it would also be fair to say that a range of actions have been taken to try to learn the lessons from what has happened in this traumatic and tragic case uh, and to hopefully prevent another case like uh, this happening. But it should be made clear that the responsibility for the actions of El Jamel sit with Professor El Jamel himself, a disgraced uh, surgeon, uh, and, 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 and uh, therefore uh, it is right, of course, that NHS TSI does look to learn lessons, but I don't think we should ever, and I know Douglas Ross is not doing this, ever look to abdicate uh, El Jamel uh, of the actions that he was responsible for. Uh, Douglas Ross will uh, undoubtedly be aware that a review was commissioned uh, by the Scottish Government, including detailed reviews of the care received by uh, a couple of uh, victims uh, of El Jamel who have spoken out very publicly, and I, I applaud them for doing so, uh, Mr Kelly and Ms Rose. And that was undertaken by two independent consultant neurosurgeons, and the recommendations of those actions been, uh, have been accepted uh, by NHS uh, Tayside. Uh, the reason why I mention that review uh, is that uh, there may be, uh, again, uh, an option short of a public inquiry that will allow uh, an independent review uh, into cases to look and to explore uh, what more can be done, what could be learnt uh, from what is a tragic uh, episode for all of those who have been affected. In terms of uh, Douglas Ross's direct question, of course, uh, Michael Matheson absolutely will uh, respond. I know this is the last, of course, FMQs of the session, but we are going to continue, of course, all of us, I suspect, work uh, right throughout the course of the summer. So I would expect Michael Matheson, uh, he will, of course, make himself available uh, where he can to continue to engage, not just with uh, cross-party MSPs, uh, but also with the victims of Professor Eldermill. It is indeed the last FMQs of the session. I have many members who are keen to put questions to the First Minister today. Douglas Ross. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I, I stress again, this is an issue that Scottish Conservatives, Labour, Liberal Democrat and SNP members met with the Health Secretary about in April, were promised an update in May, have been told this morning it will now be several more weeks. There is an urgency here, and I hope the Health Secretary and the First Minister can agree to update the concerned members today. Give them that update today before we leave for the summer recess, and then there can be further updates uh, through the summer, because there are so many unanswered questions here. Presiding officer. The First Minister uh, mentioned two victims and said NHS Tayside had accepted the outcome of the independent review of their cases, but the victims haven't. One of the patients, Jules Rose, who the First Minister mentioned, says, I have still not got answers two years on from the independent review of my case commissioned by the Scottish Government. So how can I be reassured that the new independent review will help patients? That's what they're saying about the current process uh, being suggested by the First Minister. Now, a Freedom of Information request published by the Scottish Government this morning contains minutes uh, of a meeting held between NHS Tayside uh, and uh, Dr El Jamel on the 3rd of June 2013. During that meeting, Dr El Jamel seems to go off practically scot-free. Junior doctors are blamed in this for mistakes made by Dr El Jamel. And the Health Board seems to accept his heartless promise to, and I quote, maintain the quality of his service. That is just scandalous. So when he was Health Secretary, did Hamza Yusuf demand to know from NHS Tayside what they knew and when they knew it? First Minister. Uh, yes, I had a range of conversations with NHS Tayside, including with the Chief Executive and the Chair on this issue of Professor uh, El Jamel. Of course, uh, Douglas Ross will be uh, well aware and I'm happy to ensure that he gets a written update in this regard uh, of the actions that were taken forward by NHS Tayside. I am not standing here. I suspect, uh, in fact, I know that the Chair and the Chief Executive of NHS Tayside would not say that there were, were not lessons to be learnt uh, from uh, the tragic case uh, that has affected so many victims, including uh, Ms Rose uh, and uh, Mr Kelly, two patients who I have met and that we will continue to engage with. In terms of the specific issues around uh, engagement with patients, um, there is uh, an, an established that there has been a, a, an established process uh, for former patients of Professor El Jamel to contact uh, NHS Tayside, and that there is also an independent mediator that's been appointed to work with NHS Tayside and two former patients uh, whose experiences were reviewed 
uh, by the Scottish Government uh, and, and two independent consultant neurosurgeons. So that engagement with patients absolutely will continue. Uh, as I say, there are some outgoing, there are some outstanding questions that I know patients want answered. I do believe that we can work with NHS Tayside to try to get those answers. Uh, there is a request being made by a number of MSPs by Douglas Ross for a public inquiry. It's not ruled and uh, out uh, off the table, not taken off the table, but I do think that there, are, there may be other ways to get the answers that Ms Mallet, Mr uh, Kelly, uh, Ms Rose and many other victims of LGML absolutely deserve. Douglas Ross. The Freedom of Information request that was published this morning by the Scottish Government also shows that complaints were mounting from victims but in many cases were dis dismissed. Complaints were growing as well from NHS Tayside staff who appear to have originally raised the alarm back in 2009. But healthcare professionals say they were warned not to speak out. One whistleblower said, I did raise concerns at the time, but I was shut down. It went all the way to the board. They knew about it. The First Minister is saying that a public inquiry is not off the table, but he needs to be clearer. He needs to say it is on the table, it is going to happen. The actions of Dr El Jamil ruined people's lives, but the actions of the Health Board suggest a cover-up at the highest level. First Minister, doesn't this simply demand a full public inquiry? First Minister. So again, I, I would take the points that Douglas, raise, uh, Douglas Ross raises uh, in turn. In terms of the whistleblowing processes in 2009, I think by any objective uh, observation, uh, there has been improvements in terms of the whistleblowing uh, processes. I've met to myself uh, when I was Cabinet Secretary for Health and Social Care with whistleblowing champions in our territorial uh, health boards. There have been improvements in the whistleblowing process uh, since 2009, since uh, that particular statement was made uh, by the member of uh, staff. Uh, my predecessor, uh, has, when, when stood here, has often, uh, did often say, and I will reiterate this point, that whistleblowers uh, can, of course, and should go through the appropriate whistleblowing route, but if they ever want to contact the government directly about concerns that they have, they can absolutely uh, do that too. We take issues of whistleblowing extremely uh, seriously, indeed, regardless of which health board uh, is uh, affected. So again, I, I will uh, really end uh, where, where, where I started in terms of the questioning from Douglas Ross. This is an incredibly serious issue. It's an issue where individuals have been left utterly traumatised. We will work with those individuals, those victims, those survivors, in order to try to get them the answers they absolutely deserve. And of course, a public inquiry is not ruled off the table, but let's look at how we can get them the answers they deserve as quickly as we possibly can. Question number two, Anna Sarwa. Presenting officer, this week the UK COVID inquiry has started to take evidence from Scottish Government witnesses. It is the first we are hearing from the Scottish Government in any public inquiry about their response to the COVID pandemic. Three years on from the start of the pandemic, bereaved families are still waiting for answers. But here in Scotland, families are going to have to wait even longer. Because last year, the chair of the Scottish COVID inquiry and its legal team walked out. And we still have little idea of when the inquiry will begin questioning ministers and officials, let alone when it will conclude. So, First Minister, will grieving families get the answers they deserve by the end of this Parliament? First Minister. I can thank Anna Sauer for raising what is an incredibly important issue uh, indeed. And he will be looking at and observing the UK COVID inquiry, uh, for which, of course, there are a number of Scottish witnesses uh, in front of the UK inquiry uh, today. Uh, Anna Sarwar, as an experienced member uh, of this parliament, of course, will know that it would be inappropriate for me as the First Minister, deeply inappropriate for me as the First Minister, to interfere or intervene in what is an independent uh, public uh, inquiry. Um, of course, we want the COVID inquiry to be delivered at speed. Uh, but what I will say to Anna Sarwar uh, is, uh, having met the bereaved families uh, myself, I can completely understand why they want that COVID inquiry to move, the Scottish COVID inquiry to move at pace. Um, it's so important that the COVID inquiry takes the necessary steps. Uh, it has to, to get those answers in a transparent uh, way and manner. And the final thing I'll say to Anna Sarwar, uh, which I'm happy to repeat uh, time and time and time again, uh, whatever we can do to cooperate with the inquiry uh, from the Scottish Government, we absolutely will. Anna Sarwar. 
I hear what the First Minister said, but this is important for thousands of families who have lost a loved one to NHS and care staff and everyone across Scotland who will be frustrated by the Scottish inquiry running behind because we must learn the lessons of the pandemic. But the inquiry's conclusions will only be as good as the evidence it receives. Over the past few weeks, people have been horrified by the UK government's decision to withhold evidence from the UK inquiry. In Scotland, the Scottish inquiry team issued do not destroy letters to public bodies, including the Scottish government last August. It made clear that all documents, including emails, texts or WhatsApp messages should be retained and that any destruction of these messages is a criminal offence. So can the First Minister confirm that all ministers and officials, past and present, have complied with the do not destroy instruction? And will he give a guarantee that all requested emails, texts or WhatsApp messages will be handed over, over in full to the inquiry? First Minister. Uh, yes, uh, they will. Uh, and of course, it is important that I uh, abide by the rules of both the UK uh, Public Inquiry and the Scot Scottish uh, Public Inquiry. Section 17 of the Inquiries Act 2005 gives the Chair alone the responsibility to decide how an inquiry should operate. It's therefore a matter for the independent inquiry chairs to make decisions as to what material they request from the Scottish Government uh, or indeed from other participants. Uh, both inquiries have taken the decision again, the independent decision, not a decision uh, that I uh, interfere uh, in whatsoever, but both inquiries have taken the decision not to publish details of the request they are making to participants. But all participants, including the Scottish Government, um, have been asked by the inquiry uh, not to share the content uh, of requests uh, that they receive. And so, of, of course, the Scottish Government uh, will comply uh, with the request. But to ensure there is simply no doubt whatsoever uh, any material that is asked for, WhatsApp messages, emails, signal, telegram, whatever <coughs> is asked for or requested, will absolutely be handed over uh, to the COVID inquiries uh, and handed over to them in full. Anna Sarwar. So this is, this is really significant. So to confirm... The First Minister has told us that all ministers and officials, past and present, have complied with the Do Not Destroy instruction, and that all ministers and officials, past and present, will hand over all evidence in full without omission and evasion. As I say, a really significant intervention from the First Minister. Because COVID took a heavy toll on everyone across this country, and we continue to feel its impact. The least we can expect is that when grieving families come looking for answers, this SNP government provides them. Because we know, sadly, that this is a government famed for a culture of secrecy and cover-up. Last week, Dr Lisa Mitchell Casey, the lawyer for the bereaved families across Scotland, said this at the UK COVID inquiry. No person, no institution, no matter how powerful, whether it be in England, Scotland, Wales or Northern Ireland, Westminster, Holyrood, can obstruct the search for truth. So will the First Minister commit to writing to me and other members of this Parliament outlining what steps the Scottish Government has taken to ensure that all ministers and officials, past and present, have complied with the do not, destruct order, do not destroy order and how this data is being retained and how it will be handed over to the inquiry? First Minister. Well, I think that um, question from Anna Sawar is because he didn't expect me to, yeah. of course, say that I would fully comply with the COVID public inquiry. So he was not able to adapt his second question as a result of the answer. So I'm happy to reiterate what I've already said to Anna Sawar. This is a really important issue. So the Labour may not want to heckle this point. I think it's really important for me to absolutely reiterate that we have, of course, and have had a long-standing policy on retention uh, of uh, documents, and not just documents, in fact, uh, as per email or written correspondence, but including social media messages. Uh, so I'm more than happy for that uh, guidance to be shared. I'm more than happy to write to Anna Sawa or any other member who has an interest uh, around um, how we comply with those uh, various guidelines that are very much in place. What I would also say to Anna Sawar is this is absolutely about the bereaved families. That's why the government has met with the families who have been bereaved uh, by uh, COVID. We will cooperate fully 
uh, with that inquiry. Uh, Anna Sarwar suggests that we are not transparent. I would remind him that it is this government who instructed that public inquiry. Yeah. And I would also remind Anna Sarwar, in fact, it was my predecessor who stood up every single day yeah. during that pandemic yeah. to face questions from the press in order to communicate as openly yeah. and transparently as possible. So uh, we are transparent as a government. We'll continue to be transparent. Uh, First in, uh, Minister, and we will First continue Minister. If, if I could stop you there, could we please stop having conversations across the aisles? It makes it very difficult to hear. First Minister. And we will continue to cooperate fully with both public inquiries. Thank you. Question number three, Alex Cole Hamilton. The presiding officer to ask the First Minister when the Cabinet will next meet. First Minister. Uh, we'll be meeting a few times uh, throughout the course of the summer recess. Alex Cole Hamilton. I'm very grateful for that reply. Reinforced, autoclaved, aerated concrete is a light and bubbly material that was used in public sector construction for decades. Think of the inside of an aero bar and you get the idea. But in February, NHS Scotland issued a safety action notice. It warned that roofs, walls and flooring made of this material are, and I quote, at risk of catastrophic structural failure, which could occur suddenly and without warning. A school roof has already collapsed in Kent. Now, Liberal Democrat research published in The Times has established that this concrete has so far been found by at least four Scottish health boards and in 37 schools up and down our country. It's above patients and it's above pupils. I am not trying to frighten people here, but we do need to identify the buildings at risk and fix them. That could cost tens or hundreds of millions of pounds. So will the First Minister establish a national fund to help hard up health boards and councils make these buildings safe? First Minister. I, I appreciate uh, and I thank uh, Alex Go Hamilton for raising uh, an important issue uh, around aerated uh, concrete. Uh, what I would say to Alex Go Hamilton before discussions on any fund that may or may not be necessary is really important, as Alex Go Hamilton alludes to in his question, that we understand the scale and the scope of the problem and the challenge that we're facing. And therefore, uh, I'm happy to write to Alex Go Hamilton with more detail, but I'll give him one example in relation to health boards. NHS is sure are already uh, conducting a, a review into this issue, uh, quite, a, quite a, an intrusive review, actually, to understand uh, the nature of what we're dealing with and the scope of what we are dealing with. So Alex Go Hamilton is absolutely right to raise a very important issue. I will give consideration to uh, the matter he raises around a fund, but before doing so, what I would say to Alex Go Hamilton, it's really important, imperative, in fact, uh, vital that we understand the scope and the nature of what we're dealing with. And thereafter, I'm happy uh, to give consideration to Alex Go Hamilton's suggestion. I will write to Alex Go Hamilton with details of the reviews that we're conducting uh, in buildings that, uh, the uh, that we are uh, responsible for. Question number four, Bill Kidd. Thank you very much, President Officer. To ask the First Minister what steps the Scottish Government is taking to help raise awareness of the importance of stem cell donation in the treatment of blood cancer and blood disorders. First Minister. Thank uh, Bill Kidd for raising this important issue. I fully agree that increasing awareness of the importance of stem cell donations is absolutely vital, especially in those where more donors are needed to sign up, including men and those from BAME communities as well. I myself have been in the register for stem cell uh, donors for nearly two decades. The Scottish Government recognises the importance of stem cell donations and continues to promote it alongside key partners like uh, Anthony Nolan through a number of initiatives. Uh, we have included information on our Organ Donation Scotland website, which provides the public with information on how they can register as a stem cell donor. And I would encourage everybody to look at that website and to register. Last year, we also uh, launched our updated school resource to educate children and young people about organ donation about organ uh, tissue and stem cell donation. Nationally, the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service, Scottish National Blood Transfusion, Transfusion Service and Police Scotland have partnered with Anthony Nolan to promote stem cell donation and encourage staff, young people and school pupils to register as a potential donor. And lastly, our new cancer strat strategy, which uh, will work towards improving cancer survival uh, and providing excellent equitable access uh, to care. Bill Kidd. I uh, thank the First Minister for that reply and um, join him in welcoming the partnerships uh, which take place with the Anthony Nolan Trust 
Um, and I note that he mentioned the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service. Will he also join me in congratulating the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service on receiving the Shirley Nolan Special Recognition Award for its efforts to raise awareness and inspire others to sign up to the Stem Cell Register for the Anthony Nolan Trust? First Minister. I, I absolutely will. The Scottish Fire and Rescue Service uh, deserve uh, every bit of credit for the excellent partnership work that they do uh, with the Anthony uh, Nolan Trust. I absolutely echo uh, Bill Kidd's words and uh, once again uh, congratulate the Scottish Fire and Rescue uh, Service on their well-deserved uh, award. I think I, I should also, uh, presenting officer, take the opportunity uh, to recognise the tireless work of uh, Bill Kidd in highlighting the importance of stem cell donation. And uh, that was rightly recognised, in fact, by the awards. Uh, the, uh, he was uh, rightly recognised as political supporter uh, of the year at Anthony Nolan Support Awards and very well deserved indeed. Yeah, <laughs> Question number five, Jackson Carlow. Uh, to ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's response is to the recommendations in the report Transvaginal Mesh Case Record Review by Professor Alison Britton. First Minister. Well, can I first uh, put on record uh, my uh, thanks to Jackson Carlaw and, and others, but I think it's important to recognise Jackson Carlaw's tireless efforts in uh, standing up for and advocating on behalf of those uh, women who have suffered, those women who have suffered uh, as a result of transvaginal mesh uh, implants. I am uh, grateful to Professor Britton and her team for undertaking what I think, uh, what, what, what I don't think actually, I don't doubt for a minute, is a very thorough and insightful uh, piece of work. I would express my thanks to the patients who took part in the review. I sincerely hope that they found it beneficial. And I don't need to say to Jackson Carla or anybody else in this chamber how uh, uh, traumatic and re-traumatizing it can be uh, for uh, those survivors to continue to tell their story. Uh, we have taken many steps already that address a number of Professor Britton's findings. We've introduced new training for GPs about mesh. We've improved information for patients about the specialist mesh removal service in Glasgow. And the chief medical officer continues to champion shared decision-making through his realistic medicine initiative. However, we will, of course, uh, now study the report in great detail and consider what further steps have to be taken. Jackson Carlow. Uh, well, can I thank the First Minister for that and for his engagement with the issue? And I wonder if he would commit when the government has uh, responded in full to the report uh, to a full chamber debate in uh, the autumn uh, for us to consider it. But can I ask him to react to the observation by Professor Britton in the introduction and overview to this report, where she comments in a parallel report she was invited uh, to undertake by the now Deputy First Minister in 2017, and which was published in 2018. And she says this, the report highlighted a number of failings and made recommendations on how independent reviews should be conducted in the future. Despite being well received, to date none, none of the 46 recommendations have been implemented by the Scottish Government. Now he's referred to the work that colleagues across the Chamber have done over the last decade with these women. Does he understand their dismay and frustration that none of 46 recommendations made five years ago have been implemented? And can I ask him, what will he do to rectify that? First Minister. Presiding officer, uh, I'm very happy for the government to commit to uh, bring a debate forward uh, to this chamber in order to discuss uh, and engage again uh, in this important uh, issue uh, once we have uh, and once we are ready to respond uh, to the latest uh, review. In terms of the 2018 uh, investigative uh, review, we did accept and agreed with the vast majority of Professor Britton's conclusions, and those recommendations have actually already been reflected in a number of inquiries and reviews that have been established uh, in uh, recent years. We're also developing guidance to support inquiries and reviews that will very much build upon Professor Britton's recommendations and hope to publish that shortly. And I'm happy to communicate uh, with both Jackson Carlow and, of course, with Professor uh, Britton directly to give uh, Jackson Carlow and her and anybody else uh, who has some concerns uh, around those recommendations, but I can give an absolute uh, commitment that uh, not only have we agreed, but a number of those commitments, those recommendations, forgive me, uh, have been uh, already implemented uh, in reviews that we have taken forward. Take a brief supplementary from Stuart McMillan. Uh, thank you, President uh, Officer. The First Minister will be very much aware of uh, my support for a number of my constituents. 
um, who have uh, suffered the horrors of transvaginal mesh implants. And the women uh, have my unwavering support in their efforts to firstly have the mesh removed and secondly seek answers as to why the NHS services have often seemed to work against them instead of for them. Now, notwithstanding obviously what the First Minister has said today, can I ask the First Minister to ensure that the report is considered and responded to as soon as possible, given the continued difficulties many women in my constituents across Scotland are facing at present, but also because of the, the lack of trust many women actually have had in the NHS, particularly with regards to mesh services? First Minister. Can I thank uh, Stuart McMillan and again recognise uh, the tireless advocacy that he has done uh, on behalf of constituents uh, who have been affected uh, by uh, the implant implantation of transvaginal mesh. Uh, I think for me it is incredibly important to reiterate uh, that I pay tribute to the women who have come forward bravely uh, over the years uh, to, to, to tell their story, uh, because Stuart McMillan is absolutely right. Uh, many of them have used words like gaslight. They, they have not been believed, uh, that they do not have trust uh, in the authorities in the NHS uh, in the various processes that we have brought forward. So it's so important that everything we do, uh, we bear in mind uh, that lesson, uh, that we ensure that uh, we give uh, the survivors uh, in these cases uh, trust in the processes that we're bringing uh, forward. And I've met many women, some of them constituents of mine, uh, others right across the country who have suffered uh, as a result of uh, transvaginal uh, mesh uh, being uh, implanted. So we will uh, respond, uh, as, as Stuart McMillan asks, we will respond as soon as we possibly can. And as I've said to, in my response to Jackson Carlo, I think it would be a good idea uh, that he suggests uh, of bringing a debate to this parliament so we can have a full and frank uh, discussion and debate about it. Jackie Bailey, brief supplementary, please. The review also recommends that all information on MESH is drawn into a single website to keep patients informed. Will the First Minister commit today to publishing waiting times on the website to inform patients about how long it will take to get their treatment, given that some are being forced to wait as long as 448 days? Will he take action to end these unacceptable waiting times as a matter of urgency? First Minister, concisely. Uh, well, I'm more than happy to look at what more we can do uh, to be transparent as we are around uh, waiting times. When I look at, for example, the Glasgow Mesh Service, there's simply no doubt that that has been affected uh, because of the pandemic and, and surgery was paused for a time due to particularly COVID and winter pressures. Uh, however, I was looking at the Glasgow Mesh Service uh, latest data on surgeries um, since they have been restarted. Uh, that service uh, will soon be able to operate within uh, 12 weeks uh, of the patient. Uh, and, and their clinician deciding upon the course of treatment. So we are making progress around uh, some of the treatments that are available, uh, but I will look into the issue around transparency around waiting times uh, and report back to the member. Thank you. Question number six, Monica Lennon. To ask the First Minister whether he can provide an update on the Scottish Government's commitment to roll out universal free school meals amid concerns that there will be further delays to the expansion of universal free school meal provision for primary six and sevens, and that no progress has been made on the Scottish Government's commitment to establish a secondary school pilot scheme. First Minister. Well, can I say I'm very proud of the progress that the SNP-led Scottish Government has made in the universal rollout of free school meals, P1 to P5, maybe a lesson for other uh, political parties right across the UK to look towards Scotland to see what we have done. And I can give a commitment to Monica Lennon and for all of those who are interested that we are absolutely committed to the rollout of universal free school meals in primary schools and uh, we have said as we have said out previously the next phase will be to all primary sixes and seven uh, pupils in receipt of the Scottish child payment that's the next phase of that uh, universal expansion we're also committed to delivering the pilot uh, on a pilot of free universal uh, school meals in secondary schools and we continue to work closely with our delivery partners including of course local authorities uh, on our expansion program uh, which includes considering the appropriate time scales for rollout. Monica Lennon. The Scottish Government was leading the rest of the UK on universal free school meal rollout but the work has stalled First Minister and we are falling behind. Under Nicola Sturgeon the P6 and 7 expansion was delayed and last year's announcement to pilot provision in secondary schools has amounted to nothing. Close working with the Jess communication. I have FOI'd every local authority. There's not even been a phone call from the Scottish Government to any school or council in Scotland about this. Instead of prioritising hungry children, 
the government approached COSLA at the start of this month to broker further delays. Astonishingly, councils are now being warned the full rollout in primary schools may not happen within this parliament. Children are going hungry today and they cannot wait until 2026. Can I have a question, so, please, Will the Scottish Government keep its promise to Scotland's children? And can the First Minister guarantee that the rollout will be delivered by the end of this parliament? First Minister. I would love to see the evidence for Monica Lennon's claim that we are falling behind other parts of the UK. Simply untrue. We are leading the rest of the UK when it comes to the provision of free school meals. If I, look, if I look at the uptake, for example, in 2022, over 215,000 free school lunches were provided to children and young people. That's an increase from the previous high of 194,000 free lunches provided in 2016. Registrations for free school meals have reached their highest ever level as our free school meals expansion programme continues. So yes, there are challenges in relation to the rollout. We know there are challenges around, for example, the capital infrastructure that is required in order to ensure that we can progress uh, that uh, universal rollout. And when it comes to uh, ensuring we tackle poverty and child poverty, in particular, I would remind uh, Monica Lennon, it is the SNP-led Scottish Government that introduced the Scottish Child Payment and it's estimated through the actions that we have taken with this limited measure of self-government, it's estimated that we'll lift 90,000 children out of poverty. It is the SNP-led Scottish Government that, for example, has scrapped uh, tuition fees, something that Labour Party have you turned? And of course, it is now the Labour Party in the UK that have now said they will not progress with free school meal provision in the rest of the UK. So instead of chiding the Scottish Government for what they're actually doing, Monica Lennon may well want to speak to her own party and get them to follow the SNP's lead. Thank you. I'm moving to... Actually, I'm going to take Brian Whittle out after a brief supplementary. So, and then we will move on to constituency and general supplementaries. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. I wonder if the First Minister agrees with me that if we were to offer preschool activities along with a healthy breakfast, we would be directly tackling the attainment gap, poor behaviour in class, hunger, poor me mental and physical health, and that that kind of intervention would be a proactive step in tackling real issues that have, been, have not been efficiently dealt with for many years. First Minister. Well, again, we have already made provision when it comes to children's activities. We're also, of course, uh, committed uh, to developing plans to deliver free breakfast to all primary and, and special uh, school uh, children uh, as well. So we are uh, absolutely committed to, to doing all of uh, these measures and progressing them as fast as we possibly can. Uh, that is why we've increased our funding to local authorities this financial year. What makes that job remarkably more difficult is yeah. when the UK government continues to cut our budget for yeah, Absolutely. Thank you. We move to constituency and general supplementaries. I call John Mason. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm sure the First Minister would agree with me that it was very welcome to Public Health Scotland's report this week uh, saying how beneficial the minimum unit of pricing of alcohol has been and how lives have been saved. Would he be able to say anything about increasing the price from 50 pence perhaps to 65? Or does he think the UK Government might veto that with the Internal Market Act? First Minister. John Mason makes a very uh, good point uh, indeed. There is simply no doubt, I think, in anyone's mind that if the Internal Market Act had been in place when we first introduced minimum unit pricing, the UK Government would have struck it down. Yeah. Simply yeah. no doubt yeah, yeah. whatsoever Absolutely. that that would have been the case. Uh, what I will say to John Mason in response to his first question uh, is, of course, uh, I am really pleased uh, to see the progress that is being made through the, uh, pr uh, through the introduction of minimum, minimum unit uh, pricing. It is quite literally uh, saving uh, lives. Uh, the only tragedy is, my goodness, if we were able to have implemented that policy earlier, if it hadn't had to be dragged uh, through the courts, how many more lives could have yeah. absolutely been saved? Uh, John Mason will be aware of the review work that is underway. It's so important, given the legal challenges that we've had previously, so important that we allow that review work to take place so that we, are absolutely, we have an absolutely robust evidence base uh, for any decisions that are made around uh, any increase in the minimum unit price. Megan Gallagher. 
Thank you, Presiding Officer. The First Minister will be aware of the recent decision taken by North Lanarkshire Council to let go of 130 teachers before the summer holidays. Education chiefs emailed 80 primary and 50 secondary teachers last Friday to tell them they could no longer offer them temporary or fixed term contracts from August. The EIS have rightly condemned this decision as many teachers will be looking for jobs over the summer holidays. The Council have responded saying that the Scottish Government funding for teacher recruitment has fallen substantially. In the last two years alone, there has been a £1.8 million reduction. First Minister, cuts to education budgets means cuts to teacher numbers. So can I ask what reassurance he can provide to the 130 teachers who will be really concerned and upset by the decision taken by North Lanarkshire Council? First Minister. I'm happy to correct the record if I'm wrong, of course, but I believe that council has been propped up by the Conservative yeah. Party oh. uh, and Megan Gallagher is, uh, may want to have a word with her Conservative colleagues uh, about their abysmal decision to let teachers go. Thank you. What I would say from a Scottish Government perspective, uh, we are, uh, of course, increasing resources available to local government by over £793 million. That represents a real terms increase of £376 million, uh, or indeed of uh, 3%. Now, I would, of course, uh, urge any local authority, regardless of whoever is in administration, to engage uh, with schools, to engage with teachers uh, in relation uh, to their employment. But as I've said already to Brian Whittle, what is not helped, of course, is by, is by our public finances, frankly, being decimated by the Westminster Government. That won't help us to fund local government at one penny. Pam Duncan Glancy, can I just ask Mr Kerr um, to please resist any temptation to contribute, particularly where it's not necessarily courteous? Pam Duncan Glancy. Um, thank, thank you, Presiding Officer, and I draw members' attention to my register of interest as a member of Unison Scotland. Unison are outside Parliament today because the college sector is in crisis, one felt most deeply by the staff facing compulsory redundancy in the city of Glasgow College. After meeting the principal last week, I remain deeply concerned about the cuts, but also about the process to come to the decision to make redundancies. So can I ask the First Minister, will he personally intervene and encourage more scrutiny of that decision? And will he meet union members outside Parliament today to hear directly how bad things have got for colleges, staff and students. First Minister. What I would say to Pam Duncan Glancy is that I have already met, met with trade unions, including, for example, the UCU, who were at a roundtable discussion with me that uh, myself and the trade unions, the STUC, uh, co chaired. So I have been uh, already engaging with trade unions, and I know uh, the situation uh, that Pam Duncan Glancy does describe. And of course, the uh, Minister for Higher Education and Further Education wrote to college principals reminding them of the fact that, of course, while these are decisions for the colleges to take, it is so important that fair work is the guiding principle whenever it comes to these discussions. So I will uh, receive an update uh, from uh, the Minister. Uh, and, of course, uh, while these are decisions for colleges to make, I will remind them again today publicly uh, that fair work must be at the heart of every decision that they take. Bob Doris. President Officer. A recent serious fire at the abandoned Promat factory in Springburn left local communities for two days enduring stifling smoke and fumes and firefighters putting their lives at risk. The fire service informed me they believe the site is a major hazard and a danger to anyone entering it, and given the scale of the site, it cannot possibly be made safe. Can I ask the First Minister that, given there, are may, there may be insufficient powers to allow the local authority to effectively intervene to get the site owners to make the complex as safe as possible, and ultimately clear the site, will the Scottish Government meet with me to discuss what powers may exist, or indeed, President Officer, which further powers may be required in this place to take action on sites such as Pro Martin Springburn to better protect our communities? First Minister. I am grateful to Bob Doris for raising the issue of the Promat site uh, in uh, Springburn. And, uh, of course, I will await further details from Bob Doris, but uh, in response to his direct question, I am more than happy for the Scottish Government the relevant minister to engage with Bob Doris to see if there is anything further we can do uh, to address the issues that Bob Doris quite rightly raises uh, in the Chamber. Miles Briggs. 
Acting Officer, it's now over nine weeks since the Edinburgh Tram Inquiry was sent to the printers, more than nine years after it was announced and three years since it stopped hearing evidence. It's cost Scottish taxpayers over £13 million, including the Chair being paid over a million pounds. Now, I know the First Minister cannot today uh, comment on the findings of that inquiry, but can I ask the First Minister if the Scottish Government will agree to Parliament debating the inquiry findings when published in Government time, and what review will now be undertaken into the delivery of this inquiry, as it's vital that lessons are learned for future public inquiries, and what's gone so wrong in delivering this one? First Minister. I, I would just remind um, Miles Briggs of the fact that, of course, this is an independent public uh, inquiry. Uh, I am not able to interfere or intervene uh, when it comes to the timescale of that public uh, inquiry. I have seen the same press reports that Miles Briggs uh, has seen that, uh, that and, and all I would say is that when that uh, trams inquiry is ready to be published, there will certainly be no objection uh, from the Scottish Government, from me as First Minister, to get that uh, public inquiry published as soon as possible. I think it should be published as soon as it is absolutely uh, ready for it to be published. Uh, but it is so important that when it comes to that public inquiry, that independent public inquiry, uh, neither myself nor anybody in the Scottish Government is seen to interfere, interfere or intervene in any way whatsoever. Foisal Chowdhury. Thank you, Presiding Officer. My constituent, Wendy, has struggled with joint pain for several years. She was finally added to the orthopedics outpatient waiting list in June 2022. Last month, it confirmed that she was on the waiting list for a knee replacement. The wait is currently two and a half years. This would take Wendy's overall waiting time to over five years. Wendy is in uh, constant pain and her quality of life has been seriously impacted by this. Does the First Minister think this wait time is acceptable? And can he advise what the Scottish Government are doing to achieve its legal guarantee of 12 weeks for inpatient treatment under the Patients Right Scotland Act? First Minister. I can say directly to, to Faisal uh, Chaudhry the, the wait that he describes is not acceptable. I'm more than happy for Faisal Chaudhry uh, to, of course, contact uh, me to see if there's anything further that can be done in, in Wendy's uh, particular uh, case. Uh, what I would say to Faisal Chaudhry, and I know he understands this well, that there's no doubt at all that health services right across the UK, across Europe, and indeed across the world, we've all been affected by the shock of the global pandemic, uh, the biggest uh, shock I suspect the NHS has ever faced in its nearly 75-year uh, existence. In terms of uh, what we are doing to make improvements in terms of waiting times, I'm more than happy to write to Voice of Chaudhry uh, uh, in detail about the many actions that we are taking. It's fair to say that when it comes to waits of over two years, uh, in a number of cases, we have made uh, significant improvements. If I look at inpatient day cases, uh, for uh, it's just one uh, example. Uh, the, the numbers waiting longer than two years for inpatient uh, day case treatment was reduced by, by 27 per cent since targets uh, were announced in terms of outpatients, uh, the, the numbers waiting over two years are down 19 per cent on the last quarter. So we are making uh, progress, but clearly in the case that Faisal Chaudhry, Chaudhry has raised, uh, I'm happy to look at that and see if there's anything we can do to help his constituent. And Maggie Chapman. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The First Minister will be aware of the Court of Appeals ruling this morning that the UK Government's plans to deport asylum seekers to Rwanda to make their applications while being held in detention centres are unlawful. This plan to remove some of the most vulnerable people, women and children among them, was always immoral and unjust. It, today we learn it is also illegal. Does the First Minister agree that this means the Home Secretary, who has dreamt of such flights to Rwanda, must resign? Uh, first, first, first Minister, First Minister, the Parliament's standing orders provide that First Minister's question time gives members the opportunity to put questions to the First Minister on matters that fall within the responsibility of the First Minister and, of course, the responsibilities of the Government. I'm not entirely clear that question met the requirement of standing orders. And that concludes First Minister's questions.
First Minister's questions is concluded. There will now be a short suspension to allow those leaving the chamber and public gallery to do so before the next item begins.